organization for his outstanding activities in research area and she is the life member of Indian Philosophical Congress and life member of Akhila Bharatiya Darshan Parishad and life member of Bihar Darshan Parishad and life member of Uttar Pradesh Darshan Parishad. He is a prolific writer and she is a good teacher. On behalf of this institution, I welcome to our research person, Dr. Niti Singh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Now I request our resource person to uh, deliver speech on uh, gender e equality. Madam, please. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Okay, I'm Neet Singh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Philosophy in Religion, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi, Uttar Pradesh. And I'm delighted that uh, the organizing committee invited me as a resource person in today's webinar. Although I feel I am not an authority in the subject area, yet I love to understand and talk about this particular notion called gender equality. So, first of all, I express my heartfelt thanks to the Kendrapara Autonomous College, Kendrapara, Orissa, Principal Sir Dr. Rajendra Prasad Tripathi, Vice Principal Sir Professor Gopal Chandra Behera, uh, UGC Coordinator Sir Dr. Pravakar Malik, Convener of the Program Sir Dr. Devakanta Sarangi, and other members of the webinar committee, especially to Mrs. R. Smitaka for providing me this platform to share my ideas on a very sensitive and important issue like uh, gender equality. So I would like to share my screen with you all so that students can follow my words and understand the concepts in a better manner. So just give me a minute, please. Yeah, uh, can you let me know whether my screen is visible to you all? No, not yet. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Just wait a minute. <clears throat> Yes, yes. Now it is visible. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, let's start. Uh, the topic of my uh, presentation of today's webinar is gender equality, a shared responsibility. As we all know that uh, recently we celebrated the 8th of March as uh, an international day, uh, International Women's Day actually, a day with over a century of history and change behind it. It was originally known as International Working Women's Day, and its roots lie in the socialist struggle of the early 20th century rather than feminism. Although national days had been celebrated before 1911, and the 18th of March of that year marked the first international day, following a proposal from uh, German communist Clara Zetkin, so why uh, why are we here talking about gender equality this is the question and why all over the world such programs like uh, webinars uh, conferences workshops activisms etc are being run for the cause of gender equality so let let's explore together and yeah. so the very first question i'm going to deal with uh, is why we have made gender equality a goal, and especially for sustainable development. Okay, the heading of this particular slide contains uh, the term goal, and we know that a goal is always that thing that is not there, and we try to achieve that. It indicates that gender equality is not the reality now. So we have set it as our goal, 
so that we could achieve it in near future. So I have two prominent reasons. The first one is that we all noticed to more or less degree that gender inequality is prevalent in our current society. It is an undeniable fact. And the second is, we also realize that this persistent gender inequality is not going to take us farther in our holistic development. So we are now in great need of gender uh, equality and it is being recognized by the UNO to make it a real situation through our collective or shared efforts. The current social structure needs a change in it and it is of great, uh, I think it is of uh, gender equality basically, which we are now talking about. And therefore, United Nations organization had said gender equality is one of the 17 sustainable development goals, which we are committed to achieving by 2030. Wherein gender equality is placed on fifth. It is again divided into six small goals. Here, these targets set by UNO for establishing gender equality are shown here in this slide. And these are the targets I have taken as it is from United Nations Sustainable Development Goals under the head of gender equality. Bold and italics are done by me to emphasize some important terms. So let us see what these six targets are. The first one says, end all forms of discrimination against all women and girls everywhere. Everywhere means worldwide, including our educational institutions. If any kind of discrimination is going on against women and girls anywhere in this world, we need to stop those discriminations by 2030. This is the first target. The second goal is about eliminating all forms of violence against all women and girls in the public and private spheres including trafficking, sexual and other types of exploitations. And we know, uh, we know that very well that girls, women and children are the easiest prey for any kind of violent behaviors in private or public places. Girl child trafficking and sexual exploitations are some forms of violence against women and girls. And they must, they, these must be stopped as soon as possible. So this is also one of the goals set by UNO. Domestic violence is one form of violence against women in their private sphere. So in the third goal, UNO appeals to eliminate all harmful practices such as child, early and forced marriages and female genital mutilation. In various part of the, uh, parts of the world, still some harmful practices are being done, such as uh, above mentioned ones, even in our country, child, early and forced marriages are practiced in a hidden way. So fourth one says, recognize and value unpaid care and domestic work through the provision of public services, infrastructure and social protection policies and the promotion of shared responsibility within the household and the family as nationally appropriate. Why this point is needed? In our culture as well, men are not supposed to perform household chores. It is culturally not accepted and appropriate. So it is needed to make a new culture. There is no doubt that women hardly find uh, any recognition and value for the domestic work and care they provide to the family. Their house chores are seldom considered as work contributed by them in the national development. Although their domestic work is of national and global importance, that has uh, already been proved in Ireland through a social experiment. When on 24th of October in 1975, Icelandic women went on strike for the day to demonstrate the indispensable work of uh, women for Ireland's economy and society and to protest wage discrepancy and unfair in, uh, employment practices. So they proved that if women would take a day off what could happen to a nation's economy and society? So their unpaid care and domestic work must be recognized. And simultaneously, men should also take equal responsibility in home. The fifth point emphasizes on ensuring women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision making in political, economic, and public life. 
I just still saying that uh, women are kept aside when the matter of decision making comes. They hardly participate effectively in leadership, whether it is social, religious, political, economic, or related to any task found in public life. Although this is not the same case everywhere globally, it varies in different socio-cultural zones. It is not because they are being stopped by some external forces, but because of lack of opportunities and adopted ambience. This is also to be ensured that their full and effective participation and equal opportunities are being counted and recorded. The last one, this part. and reproductive health and reproductive rights as agreed by the program of action of the International Conference on Population and Development and the Beijing Platform for Action and the outcome documents of their review conferences. It is also to achieve that uh, the universal access of sexual and reproductive health along with uh, reproductive rights have been preserved and served. Anyway, uh, these are the targets set by UNO to maintain gender equality throughout the world, we must not forget that we are committed to achieving this goal for a better future tomorrow. But the fact is that the world we are living in is still doing gender discrimination and we cannot deny it. So let us talk about the concept of gender discrimination. We will now see what is the meaning of gender discrimination. But before that, a brief definition of gender must be provided here. See, sex and gender are not the same. In general terms, sex refers to a person's physical characteristics at birth. And gender encompasses a person's identities, expressions, and societal roles. A person may identify with a gender that is different from their natural sex or with no gender at all. So, sex is biological or natural, and gender is Socio-cultural. Now, what do we understand by the term gender discrimination? There are various types of discrimination done in societies. But what exactly this gender discrimination is all about? So, firstly, we, we should understand what it is not. Then only we should be able to understand it properly. So, let us take a hypothetical situation. Suppose, uh, that there are 100 students and they are given free choices to select between the disciplines such as biology and mathematics. If the 50-50 ratio was there of girls and boys, by their free choice, in the math section, there are 5 girls and 45 boys. And in the biology sec section, there are 5 boys and 45 girls. Is this a case of gender discrimination? Can we say that here in the class of biology and mathematics, gender discrimination is going on? Of course not. But why? Because nobody forced them to adopt any specific subject to study, but they selected one of their own choices. So here, we can conclude that it is possible that gender disparity is there, but it is not always the case of gender discrimination. Some may object here by saying that uh, it is also coming from the societal pattern that girls are suitable for uh, biology class and boys for maths and they learn it from their environment but to show this case as one of the gender disparity and not of gender discrimination it could be said that all the other factors were equal and then also there was no discrimination done based on their gender then this is not a case of the gender discrimination. Then what is gender discrimination? It is that kind of discrimination that is done based on gender only when other factors are equal, such as when we restrict one gender to function on a given standard pattern and they are not allowed to violate that pattern. For example, earning bread is a task attached to the male gender and cooking to females. Discrimination is done when a boy is being criticized for making food at home and girls are being restricted from going outside to play on the ground. Such discriminations are called the cases of gender discrimination. When we attach some works which are not biologically restricted at all to men or women, then we do discriminate between the genders. And what is the justification for this gender discrimination? There are some people who do uh, this 
such things and they have their justification. So those people who discriminate between men and women have their justification that this gender is a fundamental natural difference because they are different and it is apparent. Such as men behave differently than women. Their uh, way of walking, dressing and presenting themselves are masculine. And they are certainly different from women who wear different dresses, makeups, hairstyles, feminine walking styles, etc. These are some visible differences that are seen in society and which differentiate men from women. So we have different patterns set in the society for both male and female genders, but there are uh, there are not only two genders found in society. There are transgenders as well, and they, they are considered as the third gender. So mainly, uh, there are three genders, male, female, and third gender. But they have different sexual orientations, such as uh, straight, lesbian, gay, transgender, gender neutral, non-binary, a gender, pangender, and queer, two-spirit, third gender, none, or a combination of these and so on. The, the list is long. And certainly, we are not here to discuss these in this lecture, so I'm not going into this debate. Uh, now I clarify that gender is not a fundamental or natural difference, but a made one. Women are not born as women, but they were made to be one in the socio-cultural environment. Simone de Boer, a very famous feminist existentialist philosopher, wrote in her uh, magnum opus, The Second Sex, which got published in 1949. One is not born, but rather becomes woman. It indicates that a woman is not born as a woman, rather made in society. They are taught how to be a woman. The same can be said about man as well, isn't it? Of course. So gender, unlike sex, is not natural, but a social cultural construct and hence not constant or unchanging, I conclude. It means biological differences in the sexes or physiology actually do not matter and hence make no ground for any kind of uh, discrimination against any gender. Then what about the biological differences between males and females? Does not it determine the, uh, the location, roles and functions of social creatures in society? People who are in favor of some forms of gender discrimination take biological differences uh, into their consideration and they seldom count any other factors existing in rational animalistic societies. They think that uh, human beings are naturally divided into male and female, so there will always be a difference in their physical, mental, social and other roles. Let's talk a bit about evolutionary psychology. We all have seen these strong impacts and influences of the Darwinian theory of evolution in almost all spheres of human lives. Biological evolution theory was the basic foundation for the theory of uh, the uh, development of societies. But it was just one factor involved in our development. Other factors are also there. We evolved not only biologically, but also socially, uh, economically, religiously, and many other factors were there. So, our biological evolution is always functioning in the background. We have rising above biological factors and we are not only biological beings, this biological factor is not unique in human societies, but the socio-cultural factors are. These factors are unique. Whatever we could have achieved uh, till the day is not only uh, because uh, we evolved biologically, but because we could evolve psychologically, socially, religiously, and politically, in which there are many factors working side by side. So naturally, women as mothers have some tasks. Okay? Women have some tasks to perform, such as a recreation, child rearing, feeding her baby, and all. We accept it. We cannot make the biological factors zero. But our societies must not accept them as the sole uh, factor to run the societal pattern. If we are going to assign only this many tasks to women by saying that this is their only function and role in society, then we are doing something necessarily wrong. These notions of gender discrimination or uh, gender equality are not all about women only. It's about men as well as other genders. 
No one's biological differences must not define and determine their locations, roles, and functions as social creatures in society. We can, of course, construct better social norms and uh, patterns than these biological ones. So biological differences did matter, but in the evolutionary history of society. And it can only explain how we evolved in this way, and nothing more than that. What I want to say here is that human societies are not only the result of merely biological evolutionary forces. Rather, it is consciously formed by the uh, infusion of characteristics specific to humans in biologically evolved groups of saplings. In principle, we treat everyone equally, but in practice, we still are discriminating among people in the name of gender, caste, class, ethnicity, religion, and so on. And that is the reason that oppressed class, ignored class, ill-treated class, exploited class, and many such classes like these get most to come into the mainstream. And whosoever was weak, or at least considered as weak, got exploited in the history, such as women, children, poor, black people, minorities, etc. So here we come to human societies to look at the causes of gender discrimination and how we arrived here. How we arrived here actually, where half of the human beings had to fight for their natural or basic rights. To understand this, we need to see the factors, features and values of human societies. Human societies are formed on the values of respect for others for differences, understanding, and things like that. Better to see the social contract theory of Hobbes, Law, Rousseau here, and uh, the most important feature is the language we have. We can communicate well, though it might be said that the animals do also possess their languages, but it is not as varied as humans. So society came into the existence, as I believe, for the welfare of humans, including women. And societies prefer constant change for the betterment of their own. So basically, there are two types of human beings. The first type is of those who believe that they know. They know everything. Like, or whatever uh, they know, they know. And the second type of humans is of those who know that they don't know. So the latter constantly reforms because they think that the best is yet to come. The collective mind is always ready to bring uh, the best version of society. The reason behind this is our human mind. The unsatisfied Socrates. A satisfied pig can never evolve socially because they are satisfied in the given situation. Those who think that uh, they know are those who embrace their primitive nature and do not allow anyone to interrupt in their personal or uh, social businesses. So they prefer living in a herd with minimum changes. But this is not true with the latter type who construct the majority now. So we welcome the reformation of society whenever we realize that there is a need. So our rational capacity goes in a dialectical way. It is always in the form of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. No matter how satisfied the situation we are put in, we create an antithesis for the same. Hence, we require the synthesis. This is what we humans possess, and this reasoning capacity is unique in human beings. We keep reforming the social structure and patterns whenever needed. So human society is a construct, and women, even if ignored, are part of human societies. It is not the case that women, slaves, labor class, or LGBTQ plus are not part of human societies. Society as a whole is being constituted by everyone who is born as a human being without considering their sexes or genders. Simone de Boer considered women as the second sex. The second sex was the subject of the private sphere, and the first sex, that is men, was a figure of public sphere or public domain. This is obviously a big debate. Society was, and even today, is divided into two spheres, private and public. And it is in practice since market and civil societies came into existence. Men were public figures. They were citizens and took part in state activities, businesses, trading and securities. They returned home, which was a private sphere. And another was with 
Others among others was his public life. Thus, man's life was divided into two spheres. In the public sphere, the first set got priority, where they could interact and work with the other units of the society for the betterment uh, of the things which they didn't enjoy personal rights over. The public was not private. But second sex mostly got placed into private space. In the private sphere, they were supposed to do things that they could enjoy personal rights over. But at the same time, they were restricted to be in a private sphere only apart from having uh, capabilities to intervene in public matters. Sadly, they were not allowed to appear in the public sphere unless and until it was unavoidably needed. So this whole debate is not a new one consisting of a history of thousand years in which our uh, human civilization got evolved. Here one can ask, what is the difference between personal and public spheres and why one is unpaid and another is paid. So the reasons provided against such a question is that for public activities, we get benefited indirectly, but we can't claim personally on public domain. When we get paid, our rights got ended over there. For example, we can claim no rights in the public domain and hence cannot enjoy complete dominance over them by considering them ours. Our job is done when we get paid and that's all. This is the reason behind paid and unpaid labor. In private spheres, what happens? We can claim our rights, my wife, my child, my home, etc. So we cannot leave our domain because we get fulfilled and satisfied emotionally there in our personal or private sphere. So which is also part and parcel of our human existence. That is the reason even today, uh, many educated women are not ready to leave their spheres for the public. Again, many can raise questions against it by saying that since they are trained to accept this private sphere as their own, that is why they choose it over the public sphere. Anyway, this particular debate can take a giant shape, so better to leave it here. It is actually not difficult to see that in a true sense, the public sphere is the uh, aspect of human life that forms society. The personal sphere is unitary. Everyone has their uh, personal spheres, which alone cannot construct society. Society is being constructed by, by the public sphere with those functions and uh, activities which are collective and shared. Therefore, those who were in the public sphere constructed society and social norms, which later on uh, identified as patriarchal. And it was quite obvious because uh, they were the makers. So they made everything as per uh, their male attitude and understanding and unintentionally, unintentionally, they become biased towards their race. Basically, uh, we all construct the society, but in the true sense, those are making society as a uh, constituents who, who are in the, or who are there in the public sphere and those who are in the private sphere are not actually constructing the society. So now the question is, why women were not allowed to take part in the public sphere? Historically, anthropologically, and socially, we are aware of the fact that the initial rule was to run the society by the strong. Okay, so Darwin said it was uh, survival of the fittest. Those who were physically strong and privileged got the opportunity to be the ruler. And due to some natural reasons, such as uh, menstruation, pregnancy of nine months, breastfeeding, etc., women were taken as physically weak and vulnerable. Comparatively, men were strong. And if I would do some charitable interpretation here, I would take it as a means for the women's protection. They were put into the private sphere. This is how women came into the private sphere, which with a gradual process became the sole place they belonged to. This process takes generations and hundreds of years to get modified uh, or changed. So since we have uh, already understood what, what was the reason that we divided uh, men and women into public and private spheres, now we would see what was the reason that this consciousness started taking place uh, in human beings, that uh, women are also capable and potential enough to be a part of the public sphere. And if needed, men, uh, men also are allowed to look after the family while being in the uh, their private zone. 
So Francis Bacon uh, gave this famous slogan that knowledge is power. Knowledge used to be a virtue in the Greek tradition, but Bacon came uh, into the initial period of modernism. And after that, we all know that there was modernity all over the world. The, the greater impact of modernity upon society was that people started seeing reason or uh, rationality as the core feature of human beings. And based on the uh, faculty of the reason, this demand started taking place that all human beings are rational animals, including women. And if it is true, so uh, they also must be given those rights which men were having at the time. So the reason is the factor that makes us human and not God, obviously. Before this era, society was uh, run through physical power on the edges of swords. And uh, after that, physical power plus the grace of God was accepted in the theocratic society, basically uh, in the medieval era. But once uh, there was there was the societal pattern where we were not giving due respect in place to reason and physical power was important. So obviously who were weaker by physics were protected in the society by providing them a secure private sphere. I don't believe that it was a uh, conspiracy of men to cage women as they saw them as their most dangerous enemies or rivalries. It was done for the protection, safety and uh, security where both women and children were kept in private and safe places. And it was not done at once, rather it evolved with the time. So in history, as well as in social and political philosophy, it is quite evident how societies took shape. And comparatively, we are less violent and less indulged in war and all today. So in the modern era, society started recognizing the worth and value of knowledge, rationality, and reasoning. Intellectuals were uh, influencing the whole society, which was limited to academia uh, only in the Greek era, especially in the Socratic period. So knowledge, as we know, is in language. So language became the foundation uh, for nation states. So when the social contract theory was introduced by Hobbes, he said that the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and barbaric. Uh, uh, it is the state where there is a war of all against all. Since the human being has the capacity of reasoning, and they understood that uh, this is not an ideal situation to live in. So they all made a contract and gave power to the Leviathan. So he recognized reason as well. And this supposition that each human being, including women, can know and understand things, opened doors for equal treatment of each human being. So power is in the reason. And when it was recognized that reason is also there in women, then only people started demanding equal rights, respect, equal treatment, etc. In, in the society. Okay? So it was possible only due to the recognition of reasoning and knowledge uh, which could be possessed by both men and women. But a long history of the kind of treatment women received made the, uh, the self-perception of women solidified as exactly how she lived for long. Women thought this was their real essence, that they are emotional, compassionate, kind, caring, and polite beings. So, and they are like uh, meant to be in the role of homemaker. Simone used to say that uh, it is not a tragedy that men saw women in one role, rather women themselves made a self-perception that was by that of men. So through universal suffrage, universal suffrage that is a right to vote in political elections. So the slogans like the personal is political and political is personal. And many other movements like that, uh, women came into the social upfront. Private is also a part of society, said the second wave feminist Carol Hanisch, who is credited with the slogan, the personal is political. And this was understood as the need of the society that this must be ended. This is a discriminatory division that uh, puts women at the side. So such a personal political dichotomy must be eliminated. But it is still persistent in societies in some ways. The real situation is, that we cannot say that the state of women, we assume, is uh, not yet fully incorporated. The formation processes are going on, but uh, we need much more effort to make this idea true because 
uh, it is expected by the collective mind and it is indeed a collective responsibility. So through such lecture programs, we are all trying to make people aware about this uh, gender discrimination, uh, which is prevalent in our societies. And this is a bad habit of society that will go away gradually with our collective efforts. So let's not stop here. Social upliftment is going on for hundreds of years and everybody now realizes that uh, force is no longer a basis for political power, but the reason is. So, the subjection of women is an essay uh, written by philosopher and political economist John Stuart Mill. Mill argues uh, in favor of legal and social equality between men and women. He writes uh, that the legal subordination of one sex to the other is wrong in itself. And now, uh, one of the chief hindrances to human improvement. The subject, uh, the subjection of women was published in 1869. And what was the legal status of women then? At the time that Mill wrote the subjection of women, women could not vote. A married woman, a woman was not a separate legal entity from her husband and any property or money she owned came under his governance. This was years ago when uh, Clara Zetkin raised her voice for universal suffrage. And in the time of Mill, it was widely believed that women were more emotional than rational and did not have the intellectual capabilities of men. So Mill argues that if women seem emotional, passive, or political, it is because they have been brought up to be so. In making this claim, Mill uh, it was Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, vindication of the rights of women, published almost 70 years earlier. So, men insist uh, that until society treats men and women equally, it will be impossible to know the natural abilities of women or whether there are uh, inherent differences between the sexes. So, it is important to treat men and women equally. And gender equality was not an issue only. Uh, female thinkers or activists who are talking about or dealing with, but main prominent figures in history took the charge uh, as well. And through their writings and decisions, they changed the scenario. So Mill's contribution is undoubtedly remarkable in this regard. And uh, his utilitarianism also gave uh, hope and courage to women. The time came when women started asking for all those privileges men were having. And it was a time when women started doing everything men were doing. And they claimed an equal share in all the public and private matters. But postmodernism and plurality came. Modernism gave us uh, universal suffrage, but later on, through uh, philosophical development in the continent, there was a postmodernism movement. Modernism gave us a well defined pattern for respect, dignity, value, and all. It made women such an entity who wanted to be and behave like men. But postmodernism shattered uh, such standard patterns uh, by giving women a liberating power. And it, it said that if you are not on a standard pattern, then also you could be true and right. And this kind of liberating you know, statements uh, which women received made them more confused about how to know who they were. So they needed to redefine themselves, and there again is a problem. The women had two things together, at least two options uh, we can say. One was the pattern of thousands of years, and the second one uh, was a desire to be like a man. So what and how she would understand and see herself? She suddenly got confused about the uh, essential nature of being a woman. She started asking herself, am I a man-like entity or a feminine one? The feminine crisis comes here. What is the meaning of being a woman? The desire of being a man-like figure was also destroyed and she wanted to get detached from the pattern she was put on for ages. So she was facing an existential crisis. And women were now searching for their place in society. They come up with some ideas. And here we can uh, take feministic movements into our account. Uh, that how their waves changed the uh, ideological perspective towards uh, feminism as well as towards the whole societal pattern. So one section held uh, the view that uh, we should take over the work and positions which are respected and fed by society and predominantly associated with men. 
it was mainly inspired by modernism but uh, it was there in a uh, post modern stage as well the other section wanted to push forward what it had become through long historical training as their identities and sought uh, for gaining respect for that they thought that uh, what we were is what we are since time immemorial so they just want to get respected recognized valued and paid for the tasks they were assigned to so care ethics get involved here they started demanding value for their emotions and and they considered themselves motherly creatures full of kindness empathy love care concern and all some sections of the women revolted against all forms of men's patterns some were radical and thought that whatever men have done was wrong and they became staunch critics of men and as such so they started breaking the norms by saying uh, that all the patterns set for men and women were based on wrong foundations so all patterns are patriarchal and we need to break them and again also some some proposed that as male patterns of society are uh, deconstructed and in a sense have failed we need to redesign redesign our society based on feminist values male patterns were destroyed and failed by post modernism so we feminists are like proposing a new pattern for society so what they did they proposed feminist values to reconstruct and uh, redesign society men value system uh, systems and patterns are needed to come to an end this was their uh, ideas and in female virtues oppression arrogance etc are not accepted so the feminist pattern wanted to give men and women equal status and respect in society and this is in true sense feminism so actually feminism is not against men but against a system that is based on inequality after talking about all these causes and reasons behind gender discrimination we are now in need of some resolutions which can uh, eradicate uh, this social curse from our society so here are my suggestions first of all our perception must be changed people have now uh, started realizing due to educational effects undoubtedly that it is the need of the hour to eradicate gender discrimination empowered citizens create an empowered society and just feel it you know once we change our perception we can see the whole picture in a different outlook we need to see that uh, each gender constitutes human society and the uh, the gender which is weak in the society makes that society comparatively weaker than the society in which all sections or genders are empowered right so gender equality along with the empowerment of all is needed this is on uh, on the level of vision the second important thing is cultural reform this one is uh, on the level of our uh, behavior that how we are taking things in the society culture is not what we carry through tradition but it is what we do in present uh, without feeling any restrictions in society so we need to shape our culture in such a way where gender equality is being ensured that a person must not be recognized as a man or women but as a person the culture making process is a literally complex idea we can only do this with equal participation and the shared responsibility of men and women at all places in the public spheres so that the uh, biological historical or uh, psychological factors may not dominate uh, the perspective towards any specific gender for example Uh, if five people are selected in an interview and four are women and just one is men we should stop gossiping that it is a partiality against men they are people they are persons and whosoever will be capable enough will get the opportunity in the form of a job or anything else so we should stop seeing people as men or women but as a person all the privilege pride and attention must not be given based on gender no matter whom we are giving the, this to whether to male or female so it is it is all a kind of gender discrimination on the psychological level so uh, next is institutional and structural reform it is also a necessary factor to empower women as well as uh, all those who are being discriminated against in uh, at, at any point in society so if women or any other group of the society for any reason do not get equal opportunity then the 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 reason is 
the unavailability of required facilities and ambience in the society for their growth. It simply means uh, we are not giving them equal opportunities and it doesn't always require stopping them from the fun. Uh, if like our institutional or structural pattern is gender biased, then indirectly gender discrimination is practiced, such as uh, the availability of public toilets for women and physically challenged people. Okay, so my last suggestion is in the favor of affirmative actions for oppressed genders, especially women here. Now the time is to give women their space so that they can get to know each other, they can create the groups of their interests and like-minded people, like men used to have uh, you know, discussions in coffee houses and all. Some affirmative actions are required here. We are not only like negating the bad things, but also inculcating something new. So women need to define their role in society and identity as a person and uh, not as a gender. They can come up with uh, various functions attached to them as a part of society. So lastly, I would conclude that the, the old Indian philosophical traditional standpoint that we have against any form of gender discrimination is self is not gender. And if it is accepted that the self is not gender, so there is no question of gender inequality. But this notion is not, not going to help us in practical life, right? Because the problem is very much socio-economic. So the resolution must come from social change. Only grand narratives won't work effectively here. So I'll say that metaphysical solutions are not enough to tackle the social problems. Like Nancy Fresher uh, gave the slogan of recognition, representation, and redistribution. We should start taking initiative to stop the discrimination by recognizing the issue and representing the suppressed class and distributing the share they deserve. So the solution is social and econo uh, economical, not metaphysical. So in, in a just society, genders must not raise a wall uh, between them, okay? because both male and female, they are two sides of the same coin. So men for women's liberation and vice versa, everyone should have, you know, should have faith in this that such changes are going to be beneficial for one and all. It will be a win-win situation for both men and women if gender equality will come and will, will be established properly in, in, in the society. So nobody is going to lose anything. Gender sensitization is highly needed and it must be started from the family. So everyone should teach their children not to discriminate among genders or sexes, but it is possible only when children will encounter the same in, in their family and later on in their society, educational institutions and workplaces. Once you are committed to doing that, you can. And if we borrow the style of Immanuel Kant, we can say we ought, therefore we can. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for your patient listening. Baby. Thank you, madam. Uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, now I will request all my participants, if any question for discussion, they may ask. Now the, all are requested if they can raise questions in this context. Any question from anyone? Then I have a question to my audience. Uh, may I ask, sir? Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm, I'm giving a riddle to all of my audience and you have to solve this. Once what happened, one father and son was going somewhere in the car and unfortunately they, they met with an accident and the father died. So some people took the son to the hospital and there in the hospital, the doctors saw the son and said, oh my God, I cannot treat him. He's my son. How is it possible? Solve the puzzle. Give me the answer. How it happened? Very good. I got an answer from Rupesh. Definitely, 
you know what happened when such questions are asked many people thought that uh, the son was having two fathers or maybe the first one was not his real father the second one was like was confused and all very few people thought or very few people think that doctor could be a woman and she could be uh, his mother as well so such types of riddles were being experimented uh, in those eras when people were not used to see women in public spheres when people were not ready and welcoming to see women as doctor lawyers you know pilots and uh, in different services and all so it's okay thank you so much rupesh kasturi and sangamitra for your answers thank you sir Question from anybody? Uh, Ma'am. Being being egalitarian on the expense of cultural and traditional demolition is good, but up to which extent can it be justified? Up to which ex extent it is? Justified? Can it be justified? Uh, see. equality when we talk about okay in my personal opinion how i take uh, these terms when we talk about equality sometimes it is uh, you know unjustified and it, it is very much clear okay when we provide everyone equal rights equal opportunity equal things equal stuff everything is equal then it it becomes uh, a kind of you know like a situation where everything is not just or not good for many people like if i'm i'm lot of uh, i'm having lot of appetite and i have some more hunger than uh, my siblings then i i must get some extra food okay so people think that equality is not a good term or better term to use when we we want to have a you know like a society where everything is just so many people used to like coin the term uh, equity here that equality is not needed equity is needed and we should practice equity uh, instead of you know equality so i i really uh, am here with that point that when we say equality it is not about you know giving the same things in same amount in in, in same way to everyone even all boys are not equal so how could we demand for such a thing that we want to be equal to men no there will be some differences and this is good this is not bad okay equality here means that uh, if we want to have a society which is a uh, gender uh, like which is based on gender equality and there is no gender discrimination it means we we are all having the proper facilities proper opportunities and proper treatment proper respect and equal respect so that is all uh, i can say and yeah your point is correct that uh, each time it is not not justified so equity must be practiced but the the sense is that there in the term equality as well uh, the term can like refer something else or in a very etymological sense it has a different meaning but it is taken basically or fundamentally in that sense only where we talk about uh, equity and all thank you anyone in answer anyone Good evening, madam, and good evening to all participants who have participated in this seminar, and our respected and revered honourable principal sir, and this sir. We are fortunate enough to have a such wonderful talk 
who is delivered by our resource person, uh, Dr. Niti Singh, who elaborates us on different aspects of gender issues and gender equalities. His points were uh, on highlighting the UN goals for gender equality and also on public and private aspects of gender, Miller's on gender, then post-modernism and plurality on gender issues, weak women and empower women issues regarding the gender, and is our suggestion regarding the gender issues, how can we eradicate such problems in our societies and how to change our perception towards genders in the society, and it's our suggestion was based upon a change of perception, cultural reforms, institutional and cultural reforms, all those things are added. Much more knowledge capabilities to our participants and also uh, great learning experience for our institutions. And uh, on behalf of my institution and also on behalf of all participants, I extend my heartfelt thanks to the madam for providing us such opportunities and time for delivering our talk. Uh, delivering her talk and also accepting our invitation as a resource person. And uh, at last, now I request Professor Ranjit Kumar Das of our institution to deliver, uh, to extend most of thanks for this um, talk or webinar. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Uh, esteemed principal, Dr. Rajan Prasad Tripathi, uh, of Kendrapada Autonomous College, Kendrapada, esteemed Dr. Niti Singh, as Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy and Religion, Panaras in the mm -hmm. University, and uh, all my all, all participants. I am very much fortunate to propose the vote of thanks. At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Niti Singh, who not only accepted our invitation, but also spent our valuable time to express all about, to all direction and all things about the gender equality. I think it will be fruitful for all the participants joining on this joining the webinar i would like to thank our honorable principal dr rajendra prasad tripathi who inspires us to arrange such a nice webinar i also thank to dr devkan sarangi who is in the charge of this uh, gender equality of our college and uh, he has taken enough uh, 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 help to organize this webinar. I also like to thank to our UGC coordinator, Dr. Prabhakar Mallik and NAC coordinator, Dr. Ganinder Das, who inspires us to arrange such a webinar and also thank to Iman Sumahapatra and Prasant Kumar Sahu and Arjasmita Kara who are the members of our uh, the gender equality section. Gender equality uh, section. Huh? And they have provided the technical support to arrange this webinar. And also I thank to all the participants, my colleagues, friends, who have joined this meeting, who have joined this webinar and fulfill their courage. And, uh, and also this webinar is helpful to all of us, I think this webinar is a very, very much fruitful. I once again thank you to all.
for attaining this webinar. Thank you all. Now the webinar is over. Thank you, ma'am. And on behalf of myself and on behalf of this institution, and to my participants. Thank you so much. Thank you.